All right, hello everyone. I'm Dimitri Pirolis, the head of our Elmore Family School of Electrical and Computer Engineering. And it's my pleasure to actually introduce the next speaker, uh, Professor Maggie Zhu. Um, Maggie actually has uh, been in our school for some time now. Uh, she's now an associate professor. Um, it's a distinct pleasure that she actually is also an alum from our school. <laughs> so she got in, uh, her uh, undergraduate and PhD degrees uh, from, from us. Uh, Maggie's working in a lot of different areas. I think she will have a really exciting talk today. Um, I'd like to highlight things like image processing, computer vision, video compression, and um, digital health. So lots of things going on. Uh, in addition to her experience at Purdue, Maggie actually also has worked in industry. She actually was with uh, Future Way Technologies for three years, and she received the certification of recognition for core technology contributions. So um, her work has received a lot of attention from the NSF, industry like Google, and also she has received the Purdue Seed for Success Award twice. So uh, thank you, Maggie. It's a great pleasure to have you here. Um, well, thank you, Dr. Prulis, for the introduction. So uh, it is a, a very exciting opportunity for me to be here today um, to share with you guys a little bit uh, on my journey um, um, till the, um, today and then um, to actually uh, look at uh, some of the work that we have done uh, developing our uh, lab. Um, so the title of my talk today is Towards Unified Visual Representation and Understanding. Um, so to start, um, so just a little bit about my journey and as Dr. Prulis has mentioned that I've spent quite a lot of time uh, in my life uh, here on the uh, Purdue West Lafayette campus. Uh, so I feel like I can, you know, call myself a true Boilermaker and this is, you know, really home for me and I appreciate uh, along the way uh, the people that I have encountered who have, you know, been my professors, teachers and some of which are now my mentors and the collaborators um, to have sort of uh, put on different lenses um, and then the interactions and the wisdoms I have received um, from them. All right, um, so uh, here is a little bit overview of my research. Um, so I work on the intersections of uh, visual understanding and representation. Um, so from a visual understanding point of view, um, videos and image contain very rich amount of information. Right, so they, and then the lot, amount of information presented are from different level of granularity, um, from, you know, a whole video down to a single pixel in the image, okay? So now there is no free lunch, right? There is a cost that's associated with these rich set of informations. And this cost is typically measured in um, bits, okay? Or in, in terms of the data rate. Right. Um, so then the problem of you know, how we represent these visual informations is basically an optimization problem. Right. So how do we minimize the cost we wanted to spend yet trying to preserve or trying to maximize um, the quality um, and then serving the different purposes, right? Whether it is for storage, it is for real-time transmission over network, or um, for the different tasks maybe down the road, whether it is you know, for human to see and to appreciate the beauties that are being captured, or for some machines to be able to interpret the data um, that it receives. Um, so here is some examples of the work that has been uh, developed uh, in our lab. Um, and then a lot of these, again, um, are works that I've done by my students and inspired um, by our collaborations with um, other peoples um, here outside of Purdue and in industry. Um, so on the top here um, is a work that we did by uh, looking at, now we have a lot of these um, deep learning models, and then to train these models are very expensive and costly, right? Um, but yet we're continuously receiving data from the real world. So how do we make these models to adapt to, to these new data without going through these costly, expensive retraining? So we did this uh, work in the case for image classification, that is to understand what are the different objects presented in the images. So in another word, we're interested in quantifying the size of objects um, in the scene without having to go through the complete 3D reconstruction, 
Okay? And then using commercially available um, sensor devices like RGB cameras, like depth sensors. Um, so in another word, um, my student and I, we were interested in looking at if we wanted to understand what are the salient objects in the scene in the pixel level, can we do this without having a full understanding of what are the different objects in the image, right? By leveraging a pair of related uh, images to be able to do that. Um, here uh, we have I can see my point a little bit. Um, so here, let's suppose we have um, some uh, string of data or images or videos that are captured under different uh, settings, environment, context, right? So how do we be able to tell from them um, the relationship between these images and to be able to cluster them into similar context? Um, in another work here, we're leveraging the human vision system uh, where it is um, very um, difficult for the human vision to tell or to distinguish the fine details within some parts of the image that contain high frequency component, such as texture-like content. But yet, these high frequency content are very costly to code, where we have to spend all these bits to encode them. Right. So by leveraging the human vision system characteristics, we were able to improve the um, uh, efficiency of coding these regions uh, much better. Therefore, we can retain, still retain good quality while spending less bits on those regions. And more recently, um, uh, our lab has been interested in looking at a uh, new network-based approach to perform lossy compression. Okay. So one interesting finding we see is that we could actually achieve these progressive decoding in the sense where we can spend very few bits, but yet we already start to see the semantics that are represented in this image. So, um, and then by adding more bits to it, we can fully reconstruct these images. So my interest uh, in research is always to think about what does all these algorithms, methods that we developed has a, a real societal impact. Okay? So one way to do this um, is partnership. So we partner with um, uh, academic um, collaborators, researchers, as well as um, industry partners. And um, here are some examples of what we were able to uh, achieve. Um, so, for example, here uh, we have a very long uh, successful collaboration man with many different nutrition scientists and practitioners all over the world to um, use our tool which, um, to do better assessment of dietary intakes in studies. So this is the image-based approach that we have developed for um, dietary assessment. Um, another example, uh, we have partnered with uh, manufacturers of headset devices where um, the device captures on the left a, what a real person's facial expression looked like, yet we wanted to reenact the same facial expression in a virtual uh, avatar. So there is this mapping that we have to do. Um, our um, texture-based coding tool is one of the uh, many new uh, coding tools available in the public uh, available open source loyalty free AV1 codec um, that has been developed by this alliance of different companies, most of which are large uh, streaming and content sharing companies and platforms. So very, we are very grateful and happy to see that uh, co collaboration come to um, fruitfulness. Um, here uh, we have a collaboration with the uh, Purdue Infant Speech. Uh, lab, where we're developing tools to help them understand what is the interaction between a caregiver and infant that um, stimulates um, or stimulates, you know, the infant speech development. Um, so uh, they were able to use our, our tools to better understand that um, interaction. We also work, work with uh, startup companies. So here's an example uh, where um, this company is interested in this photorealistic redesign of interior surfaces, like you know, what a new product will look like you know, on the floors, as a carpet, or, or you know, the countertop, without you even have to go in and do this. So this is an example for that. And the last example that I'm showing here um, is we're interested in looking at edge cloud systems, right? So particularly uh, looking at what are the complexity for the edge devices and then the type of analysis that needs to be done in the, in the cloud and how to best optimize that type of information for images and videos. Okay. 
Um, so uh, what's the next step, right? So moving forward, I'm still very much um, heavily vested in these um, two directions. Okay, and here are some examples uh, um, of that uh, direction that I see uh, moving forward. So as we have uh, many of these mobile and wearable uh, system sensors that are collecting these visual data along with other data, uh, how do we use that information to help make um, predictions for the personal responses of, for example, the foods that you're eating okay, or the environment you're in? Right? And combine that with other type of monitoring like activities or even sensors inside your body to collect microbiome information. How do we use that to model um, all these responses to um, help improve health of all? So on the other side, as we have a lot of these data collections, we need to think about what are they using for? What's the best way to represent them? Right? Are they being used um, to reconstruct the pixels so that we as humans can take a look at those, or are they used for machines to do further interpretations analysis, then the reconstruction should be tailored to the features that are in these images and videos. And as always, um, I'm looking forward to expand my collaborations, um, particularly with domain experts, because they have very unique challenges um, that I working alone in my lab will not be, you know, uh, realize those challenges. So um, these cross-disciplinary uh, research and applications are sort of um, the foundations of many of the work that we develop um, in our lab. Um, so here is a little bit about um, uh, activities related to education and mentoring. So I've been very privileged to be able to teach both at undergrad level and graduate level courses, most of which are related to um, signals and systems. Um, and I've been able to uh, mentor uh, many students who uh, I'm happy to see that are here uh, today also, uh, PhD students, masters, um, postdocs, and be able to also serve on a large number of PhD student committees. And then this is also thanks um, to the large department we have as well as the many collaborators ac across the campus um, to learn about their students' work, uh, some of which I um, do a little bit more mentoring than just serving on committees, talk about their project, um, provide my perspective, and learn from them. So I'm very grateful for those opportunities as well. Um, I've been also been involved um, in uh, many of these flagship um, uh, project courses uh, within the EC department at a college level, um, and then also in cases where um, I do independent study courses with some of our undergrad uh, students too over the summer or throughout the semester. Um, here's just a summary of some of the services, um, both internally um, uh, at Purdue uh, within our department, serving on various um, uh, department committees um, at the college level, um, as well as um, externally be participating uh, in different organization uh, committees, and then to kind of um, expand my collaborations um, in the field. Um, so here, uh, I really wanted to thank uh, all my students. Um, it always amazes me um, of their creative mind, um, but also um, their perseverance. Because sometimes, um, you know, as I was just really said, you don't just get your beautiful results in the first shot, right? So it takes time to come up with great ideas, but also um, there is a level of dedication and then perseverance to be able to really get um, to that beautiful end results um, that um, you know, you're proud um, to present. Um, and uh, many of my former students, um, they are uh, quite successful uh, um, in um, their job as well. So I'm grateful um, to be able to have such a good team um, to work on these interesting and challenging problems. Um, so they said, well, you know, what about your mentor collaborators? Um, this, I think, is the hardest slide for me to put together um, because, as you can see, I've you know, worked with many people, um, both at Purdue, uh, some of which have you know, moved away, but also you know, externally as well as with a lot of um, industry partners. Right? Um, and, then, um, and then when I think about back my journey, even when I came back here for my interviews, 
um, I met um, people who have given me advices or just asked me questions which I would have never thought of, right? And then that inspires me to continue that conversation with them uh, even before uh, I start my journey uh, here as assistant professor at Purdue. And along the way, I would say that even though we have a very large um, department in EC, um, but I always bump into my colleague in the hallway, and this becomes a little bit difficult in the past couple of years, but uh, you know, it's, it's coming back. And then just you know, having a casual conversation with them sometimes inspires a little bit in-depth discussion of research and sometimes you know it is about what is your projection of your career right what do you take in the next step so I really appreciate those small talks just you know stop say hi type of conversation that I have uh, with you know the colleagues um, in our department um, and lastly, uh, we have a group of amazing um, uh, women faculties in the College of Engineering. Um, so this is a group of people where they're, they're, they're very generous in sharing their wisdoms, okay? And they're at different levels, um, uh, different um, part of their career um, to not just give you wisdoms, but also provide the support um, that we'll need because there, it is a challenging job. Um, and, and as a mother, we have different roles to play too, right? So um, I really appreciate all their uh, mentoring and the support they have given to me uh, throughout this journey. Um, so lastly, I would like to thank um, my um, uh, support from uh, both uh, federal agencies, from various um, um, partnerships uh, with uh, industries as well as other um, universities um, throughout for uh, supporting our research. So with that, um, I would like to uh, thank you for uh, this opportunity to present um, my work and my journey. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and have some questions for Professor Zhu. Yes. Um, great presentation. Thank you for sharing um, some of the things that you have done and your background. Um, given that you have friends, you have uh, had so much time at Purdue, and then you worked in the industry as well. How has your mentoring style changed over the years, and uh, what's your overall summary or the philosophy of mentoring students? Yeah, great. Yeah, great question. Thank you. Um, uh, so I think you know, I have a great mentor. Uh, during my uh, PhD and Master II, uh, Professor Ed Delp, I think he may be uh, online here. Um, and I think I learned a lot uh, from him in terms of how to do research. Um, and then as well as, you know, we have a very large research lab at a time, so I also kind of learned about, you know, how do you interact with students. Um, but this is something where uh, no one really can truly teach you how to mentor. Right. So I work in the industry a little bit. I also have a, a great mentor during my industry work uh, as I work in a research lab. So it's sort of you one foot in the academia, one foot in industry. You still publish and all that. Um, but when I come back to Purdue, um, it's a bit of nerve wracking to have your own student to start with. Right. Um, and then um, I think at the beginning, a lot of mentality is there. Um, it is less of I teach them, but we sort of teach each other. Right, so we work very closely, um, kind of looking at problems, how to solve problems, um, and then you kind of just kind of learn from uh, you know interaction with other colleagues, right, to see how they you know mentor their student. Um, so slowly, you sort of developed. Um, to a mode where you feel comfortable with interacting with different type of students, right? And then I think what I learned most is, you know, everybody is unique. There is no um, th single style that could fit, you know, each student. And you need to have the ability to see where their strength lies, right? And where, you know, um, they, they, they could, you know, be benefit from perhaps working with a different student and so on. So I think it's uh, ever evolving and changing. Um, um, process and then I'm still learning from that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I, I saw one of your directions very interesting. You take a oh. photo of the dish and you can get calorie count. Yes. And how would that you imagine the ground truth come from? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So um, 
so typically what we've done this right now, um, before you know, we have sufficient data to come up with a pretty accurate model, is to work in dietary studies, right? So many of these studies are done in a somewhat of a, a more controlled environment. So they wouldn't know working with dietitians, so they prepare the foods and then so they weigh everything. So we have you know, the ground truths that are available you know, for those. Um, and then from the image point of view, that's right. So we, we would still be asking the domain expert to see what their you know, assessments are. Um, uh, and then that would be kind of the ground truth that, uh, that we would use to evaluate um, our approaches. I just a follow up, like, yeah. then you have to have ground truths from different countries. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, that, that is a good, good, a very good question, yes. So that's what we're looking for is to expand. So most of the collaborators we're working with are still more on a, like a Western type of diet. But uh, no, as you pointed out, when you have very different regions, people you know, prepare different, different, their different cuisines and so on. Yeah, so it is a very challenging problem. And then, but luckily, I'm not the only one who's working on that. Um, so there are um, other people around the world that are also working on similar problem and coming up with you know, very novel and interesting solutions to that. Yes? Yeah, I, I got it, Dimitri. So uh, Ma Maggie, really interesting, uh, you know, what, um, what caught my attention was, um, you know, these, these collaborations you're having with uh, other domain uh, experts, and and that's actually leading to a lot of downstream impact of your work as well, right? Beyond I the hope discipline. so. <laughs> so I guess the question is, based on your experience, you know, are there some things that we might be doing better in the College of Engineering uh, or beyond that promotes more such? Uh, I mean, was this random? Did you, or are there some things that you think actually help seed uh, some of these things? What advice do you have? <laughs> um, yeah, um, very good question. Um, I think I was lucky um, uh, because of um, you know my PhD work is also um, have is also across an interdisciplinary. So I was sort of trained in the modality of how to work with people who are not from your field, right? And then because people will speak different languages, right? Um, but I think in, in terms of uh, the um, opportunities here, I feel like since I you know came to Purdue, I've seen a lot of different opportunities that are provided for people to um, kind of talk to have very short talks about. Um, and this is, um, I feel like, become an increasing trend too, because you know, sometimes um, I go to these NSF workshops where they have people giving lightning talks of like under a minute, right? So you get to see a little bit of what people are doing. So I really like that because then you get a sense at a high level, is this someone that you would like to work with? Right, um, and then Purdue also have a lot of uh, um, big uh, strategic partnerships. Right, so um, as part of that, you get to learn, you know, with other people. As I listed here, some of these collaborators, their work, right, and think about, you know, how you can um, come up with, you know, great ideas with them together. Um, so I think that's the benefit of the being, you know, at a very large university um, because there are a lot of opportunities um, for us to learn and then to just sort of come out and then kind of talk with, with different peoples, yeah. I have a question not from online. Dr. Oh. Alabak has a question okay. and he asks, what is the most difficult career decision that you've had to make as a faculty member here at Purdue? <sighs> difficult decision. Uh, I, um, I, I, I don't feel like there is the most difficult, um, but I think, um, you know, the, the, the decision to uh, take on this job is, uh, is something that a little bit unexpected um, for me because I, you know, being uh, back in academia, be a professor wasn't, you know, my, always sort of my plan. That's why I worked in the industry a little bit. But that experience actually helped me to make the decision to coming back because I, um, I, I thought about what would I like to work on. Right, so, um, and then, so, so that is not really that difficult of a question, but uh, a, 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 um, a challenge, but uh, you know, it did take some you know, time to process. But I think um, a lot of time I feel it's difficult to decide you know, which student 
that you wanted to work with um, in your research lab. Um, um, because it takes a little bit um, trying to understand them, trying to know them a little bit better. And sometimes I have cases where it didn't quite work out, right? So student may try, they think they wanted to do a PhD, but they end up, well, you know, this may not be um, the way to go. So these are times where I have to face difficult decisions. So, um, um, but uh, you know, it's always a learning process, um, and then um, kind of to 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 get to know um, everyone that comes your way. So they they are all very unique individuals. So. Uh, Mike, one question from me as well. Uh, you're working in a really interesting uh, interdisciplinary area with a lot of unique angles. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, as we're thinking about investments in this area, right, for Purdue to uh, become even stronger. Right. What advice would you have for Purdue to think about for the next, let's say, decade? What kind of investments do we need here? <laughs> um, uh, I think, um, uh, you know, as sort of looking at um, the, the area and the field that we're working on, um, I, I think that, you know, we have been hiring a lot of excellent um, faculties. So I would, you know, really love to see, you know, that um, trend kind of moving forward. Um, and then, um, and then, you know, it's, it's, I was serving on the faculty, you know, a search committee uh, last year, and it is a difficult decisions. You see, he always is laughing too. You see all these excellent candidates. You say, well, they will be a great fit, you know, for this and that, but we can't, you know, have everyone. So, um, so yeah, so I think that is, um, it's always the people, right, that um, brings the strength um, um, to um, already a very excellent program that we have. All right, so and with that, I think we can thank Maggie once again. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, everyone.